is Greater Gospel Temple, the Church of Praise and Worship. And I am Lady, First Lady Shirley Pope Davis. And we are located at 2511 Kilburn Avenue, right here in Dallas, Texas. And I am so delighted because now we have an operational uh, place from uh, transitioning from 3422 Cedardale Road to 2511 Kilburn. And I am so thankful to the Lord. I am so thankful because the anniversary was such a wonderful, wonderful celebration. The Lord blessed and we were filled to capacity. And I am just I am just so thankful, even standing room. God is good, and he blessed us so much. And I want to say thank you to everyone that came out to worship with Greater Gospel Temple and celebrate our 30, no, excuse me, our 51st church anniversary. And Elder Davis and, and Sister Hazel Williams Davis started the church at 2502 Kilburn, Avenue, and we're right across the street at 2511 Kilburn Avenue, and I am so thankful to God. Our telephone number is 214-403-7563, and our email address is ggtchurch66 at yahoo.com, and it's Sunday school time. It's Sunday school time, and I am so excited. God is so good. He's a loving God. He's a He's a true and the living God who does everything for us. If it were not for him, we would not exist today. If it were not for him and his loving kindness and his tender mercies, we would not exist today. It's all because of God that we are yet here today. When we were in our sins, he yet had compassion and pity on us and he was patient with us and he brought us through those sins and he made a way through Jesus Christ thousands of years ago so that you and I would have a way to repent, ask forgiveness, be forgiven, and accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior so that we can be saved and we will not be condemned to hell throughout eternity. And that is the most important thing in all of our lives is that we make it into the kingdom of God and that the life we live here in this world, on this earth, it's pleasing to God, and it helps somebody else along the way. Our topic this morning is, Who Am I? And we're in Exodus, and I just had that, the third chapter of Exodus. And I'm going to the King James Version and read our scripture here. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priests of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. It could be Horeb, Horeb, okay? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. That's an amazing sight right there. The bush was not consumed. Nobody can do it like that but God, okay? And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. God called him a personal call to Moses from God. And Moses said, here am I. He had turned aside to see the great sight. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Oh my goodness. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. My God, what humbleness. And the Lord said, 
I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So he was bringing to all this land of all these, these tribes of people. So now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. My, my, my. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee, when thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God up on the mountain. My, my, my. Then we go to the 13th through the 17th verses. This is Exodus, the third chapter. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt I say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you, my, my, my. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seeing that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. My, my, my. A land flowing with milk and honey. God promised them that he would do this. And he chose Moses to do it. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. That's Exodus, the third chapter, and the twelfth verse. That's our focal verse for today. Who am I? That's the question in this lesson today. Who am I? Now, this is the L.G. Parkhurst version of the Sunday School lesson, which is based on the International Sunday School lesson. Okay? So we're going right into that lesson, and you can call me at 214-403-7563, uh, and email me at ggtchurch66 at yahoo.com. Join me this morning at 10 a.m. at 2511 Kilburn Avenue, right here in Dallas, Texas, 75216. Most scholars believe that Mount Hora, this is a commentary, okay? And Mount Sinai are two different names for the same place because the Bible says these two names interchangeably, okay? Now, Midian was a son of Abraham by Keturah, whom Abraham married after the death of Sarah. 
all right? So perhaps these Midianite ancestors settled their, settled their generations earlier when Abraham sent his son, okay? So mid, son Midian, okay, to live away from his son Isaac. Jethro could have been a priest of the true God, okay, we're talking about, this is the commentary, okay, this is the commentary part, because it seems most likely that God will send Moses to a home of true believers rather than to pagan worshipers, especially since Moses would marry a daughter of Jethro. So Moses knew how to lead sheep everywhere to find green pastures, and perhaps he had gone to the mountain of God before during his 40 years of sheep herding in the area. So perhaps he had, maybe he had, okay? He would have known all of the flora and uh, everything else there. He would know it. If he had been there, he would know the surroundings, the flora and the fauna there, and had never seen an actual burning bush blazing with fire. So he, this is something, if he had been there before, spending time there he'd never seen a bush burning and I would say he never seen one that had never burned out okay so the angel of the Lord may have been the son of God prior to his conception and human birth as Jesus Christ okay commentary right now Jesus in Mark the 12th chapter and Stephen in Acts the seventh chapter, teach about Moses and the burning bush. Now, Stephen called Mount Hora, Mount Sinai. So any normal bush, no matter how colorful, would have sharply drawn away Moses' attention as a bush that was burning and not being consumed, nor have drawn the mention by Jesus and Stephen in their teaching. Fire can be considered a sign of God's holiness that purifies but does not consume and was the case on Pentecost, okay? When flames of fire rested upon the heads of the apostles as a sign that each one had received the promised Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost had come upon them and there were flames of fire over them that proved it. So in many translations, when the Lord is in all is in all capital letters, the name Lord refers to God's name as Yahweh or Jehovah. Okay? And Yahweh in Hebrew and with without the vowels is Y W W H. So God called out to Moses by name. Moses his name meant son from the Egyptian language or brought forth, for he was brought forth from the Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter when she prov providentially saved him from death. She saved him from death, and we know that it was all in God's plan. It was all in God's plan. God had planned all of this out even before Moses was born, that he would lead his people out of Egypt. It's, it's, it's just amazing how God does what he does. And, and the reason that he does all of this is because he loves us so much in spite of all of our flaws. He loves us so much. Now the Bible shows how God talks to people using real words and events on their level, okay? To communicate truth that we can understand generations later. He talks to us on our level. He talks to us in our language. Okay? He talks to us according to our ability to understand. Because he wants us to know without a doubt. What he's saying to us. And what he wants us to do. God puts limits on how we can come and how close we can come to him. 
God sets the standards and conditions for a relationship with him. For, for God is holy. So there are standards and guidelines and everything because he's holy. God wanted the bare soles of Moses' feet on holy ground. Now sometimes we take off our shoes at the door of a home we visit or at our own home. And I heard of a lady in Denison who, uh, when she would ask people to take their shoes off before they step into her house, okay? I've heard of people doing that, and I've heard of different cultures where you take your shoes off before you enter the house. I've heard of that before. I never had, I never got to go to the lady's house in Denison, but they said that that's, that's what she would ask you to do, take your shoes off before you enter into the home, okay? So, and talking about the other, other cultures, here we go. Sometimes we take off our shoes at the door of a home we visit or at our own home so we do not track dirt and mud into or onto the clean floor. This is particularly true in Japan, see? Where we take off our shoes to show respect for the home and family and to express the honor we feel bestowed on us to be invited into the home. We need to come into the presence of God and even with an even greater respect than that for Him, okay? We need to respect Him more than we respect somebody going to their home, taking our shoes off. We respect God even more than that. Okay, even more than that, in the presence of God, we are standing on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground in the presence of God. So God maintains historical continuity so we can know the God with whom we speak. Moses knew what God was like in character and divine nature. Because he knew the life stories of God's dealings with the fathers of his faith and the Hebrew people. So Moses would have learned these truths from his mother and probably from Jethro with perhaps a Midianite slant. So Moses uh, knew enough about the power and holiness of God to hide his face in fear. So it is it just it's just amazing how God led Mo, led Moses' mother to put him in the basket, put him in the water, and then Pharaoh's daughter got him and raised him. And then there was Moses' sister who was waiting by to see who would get the baby. And then she told him, I know a nursemaid that can nurse him. And that was Moses' mother. So God had it planned out. I mean, everything he does is perfect, okay? So I don't need to say perfectly, but that's that's the vocabulary that I can use right here. He had it all planned out. So Moses was taught by his mother. He was raised by his mother, nourished by his mother. It was all in God's plan. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Moses knew enough about the power of God and holiness. And he knew that he was a sinner, a sinner in exile from his people for a murder he had committed among other sinners. From before Moses was born, God planned and prepared for Moses to meet him at the burning bush. Though born a Levite in Israel, God arranged for Moses to be raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter so Moses could learn to read and write and so he would learn the language and the proceedings of Pharaoh's court. And, and it says, I compare Moses' experience to Jeremiah, the first chapter and the fifth verse. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet in the nations, and, and that's our lives today. Well, let me, let me finish this commentary, okay? God observed the misery of his people throughout their time of slavery, and he helped them in many ways 
until the time came for God to free them from slavery and lead them into the promised land. There's so many things going through my mind right now, but I'm going to stay on point, okay? Now, God had told Abraham that his descendants would be oppressed 400 years, and since they were in Egypt 430 years, their oppression began about 30 years after Jacob and his family arrived in Egypt and after Joseph's death, because the oppression began with a pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and we can find that information or that fact in uh, Genesis the 15th chapter, the 13th verse, and then Genesis the 12th chapter, the 40th and the 41st verses. Okay, and then the suffering Israelites cried out to God in prayer. God had always planned to hear their prayers, help them in their suffering, and meet their needs according to his perfect timing and in his perfect way. But God also expected them to call out to him in prayer. So it was all a set pattern. They had requirements. God had requirements for them. And he knew he was going to deliver them, but they had their part in it also to do, okay? So though the Egyptians were mighty rulers, at that time, the Lord reigned so far above all rulers that he came down to deliver his oppressed people. He came down to deliver his oppressed people. My, my, my. They could not free themselves from slavery in Egypt anymore than people can free themselves from slavery to sin. We can't free ourselves. God has to free us. They cannot free themselves from slavery. And we cannot free ourselves from sin. We have to call upon the Lord. So those in slavery need a Savior, the Lord. God not only freed them from slavery, but God also led them to the good and fruitful land called the promised land called the promised land that he had promised Abraham he would give to his descendants. My goodness. God also taught them how to live in true freedom according to the law that he gave Moses instead of in bondage to capricious kings who commanded how they would live each day. Now these people had to live according to what somebody told them each and every day but God taught them to live in freedom to live in freedom again oh my goodness the Lord emphasized that the cry or the prayer of the Israelites meant something to him and their cries and prayers did make a difference even though he had told Abraham their future and had begun to free them from slavery even before the birth of Moses Perhaps they had cried out to God for more than a hundred years, and not just during Moses' lifetime. So God not only heard their prayers, God also saw their oppression. God saw and knew that their cries were justified and real. God takes the oppression of any people very seriously. Here, he takes the oppression of any people very seriously and God will hear the cries and prayers of all those who are oppressed in addition to seeing how they are oppressed so don't let someone convince you that God does not hear your cry don't let people convince you that he does not hear your cry if you're in sin cry out to God pray to God in the name of Jesus for deliverance and to set you free from that sin and the oppression, all right? So God cares for all his people. God had planned for Moses to free his people from before Moses was born. He had prepared and given Moses the gifts he needed to confront Pharaoh and bring God's people out of Egypt. However, God and Moses also knew that Moses could not do this by himself. Moses would need God's help, and God was ready to help. God wanted to work through Moses to achieve his purposes, and God continues to work through his people today to achieve his purposes. He works through his people to achieve 
his purposes. If we hear God, if we listen for God's voice, God will work through us to achieve his purpose. Now remember, it has to be his purpose. So we must listen to God to hear what his purpose is and then let him use us to carry it out. Okay, so God knew Moses better than Moses knew himself. God saw Moses as a great leader, and he had prepared for that particular moment in history. He prepared him for that particular moment in history. Moses saw himself as an exile from Egypt, a shepherd of sheep, a person who would never be given a family or a friendly welcome in Egypt. Okay, seeing himself as he saw himself, Moses asked the Lord, who am I? God knew Moses and God knew what he would make out of his humble servant. God knows. He knows you inside out. and He knows what you can be, what he will make you into. If you just hear God, wait on God, let him do it. Let God do it, okay? Let him do it. And remember that it's all for the glory and the honor of God. All right? Now, in answer to Moses' question, God promised, I will be with you. God being with him will solve all of his concerns and problems. So when God is with us, no matter who we are, we can do whatever the true God asks or wants us to do. You understand that? When he's with us, we can do whatever he wants us to do. We can do whatever he wants us to do. Now, the sign God gave to Moses related to Moses' future accomplishments. The sign uh, was also a sign for the Israelites who would follow him and also for who would read the Bible later because we know that God was with Moses and Moses did worship God on the mountain where Moses had met God after God had used him to free his people from slavery in Egypt. So God did give Moses smaller signs in, to perform, but the greatest sign of all was worshiping God on that same mountain with the multitude of God's people below. My God, all is all planned out. And if we stay on course, we'll see it to the end. And then we will have eternal life. We'll live with God forever. See, that's the main thing. And I cannot stress that enough. Stay on course, okay? So Egypt had many gods or idols that the Egyptians worshipped. The Israelites worshipped the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they did not know the official name of God that was set God, the Lord, apart from all the gods or idols that the Egyptians and others worshipped. Moses wanted to know the name of God so that the Israelites would know what God was coming to their rescue, and so they could call upon and worship the true God by his true name. Who should I tell them? He says, tell them I am that I am. My, my, my. God gave Moses a name rich in later philosophical and theological meaning. Moses had asked God, who am I? God gave Moses his name. I am who I am. Moses depended on God for his existence, for being who he was and who he would become. So we have to remember that second part. Who are we now and who will we become by obeying God's word? Okay? The Lord had he did not depend on anyone or anything outside of himself for who he was and what he could and would do. Now, the Egyptians worshipped the creation and various created things, such as the sun and the moon. They worshipped those things, okay? God was and is the creator of all and the foundation of all, including the sun and the moon. God exists. He self-exists, okay? God self-exists. God does not depend on anyone or anything. For his existence. God has real existence. Okay. Whereas idols have 
no existence apart from the materials out of which they are made by humans. My, my, my. So when the Lord freed the Israelites from oppression in Egypt, he demonstrated the truth of what he would later inspire the prophets to declare. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, but they cannot walk. These are idols. They can't do anything of themselves. So if they can't walk, they can't speak, they can't... What can they do for you? Nada, okay? Now, they are both stupid and foolish. The instruction given by idols is no better than wood. My, my, my. He said, don't be afraid of the idols, for they cannot do evil, nor is it in them to do good. They're just wood or whatever they're made out of, okay? For the instruction given by idols is no better than wood, and everyone is stupid and without knowledge. Knowledge. Goldsmiths are all put to shame by their idols, for their images are false, and there is no breath in them. Jeremiah 10th chapter, the 5th verse, then the 8th verse, and then the 14th verse. Now, as a true prophet of God, God told Moses exactly what to say to the people and to Pharaoh. In addition to giving Moses his name, God wanted Moses to tell the people that he was not a new God that had met Moses on a mountain. Rather than being a new God, the Lord was the God who had been with them and who had led their most important ancestors, the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now the Lord, the I am who I am, would be God's name and official title forever. Later, Jesus the Messiah would often refer to himself as I am. And you can see that in John the sixth chapter in the fifty first verse. It's the first verse, and then there are other verses in the Gospel of John that imply, okay? Now, God told his prophet, Moses, exactly what to do as well as say. Now, Moses was to work with and through the established leaders of God's people in Egypt who were also slaves in Egypt. So many of these leaders would be Levites, as were Moses and Aaron. So Moses would need a he would need many faithful leaders to help him guide and govern such a host of people as they wandered in the wilderness and as he prepared them to enter the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Now we know it took them a while, but God he fulfilled it, okay? Moses would tell Pharaoh that they wanted to leave Egypt in order to worship the Lord. And they did go to worship the Lord where Moses had met the Lord on the mountain, which is the fulfillment of what God had promised Moses. God recognized and acknowledged to the Israelites that he saw their misery in slavery and he had heard their cries. God would give them the land he had promised them when he spoke to them through Moses. Because of their sins, you hear this? Because of their sins, they had to go through this stage before they got to the promised land. So the tribes of Moses, listed in Genesis 3rd chapter, 17th verse, need to be removed from the land. And you can see that in Genesis, the 15th chapter, and 16th verse. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Lord would help the Israelites possess the land, and God wanted the leaders and people to know that the land was good and productive. It fed cattle and produced crops that fed honeybees and produced much honey. Later, because of their sins, God would remove the people of Israel from their land and send them into exile as their prophets foretold and warned them. After all of this, after all of this, then they had to go into exile again because they went back into sin again. God is good. 
He is good. He is worthy to be praised. And I am thankful to God for everything that he does for me, everything he does for you. It is a pleasure to serve God. And I am so thankful that he cleaned my life up. He let me have sense enough to know that I am a sinner and that I needed to repent of my sins, that I needed to be forgiven. And he forgave me when I cried out to him and repented of my sins and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I want to fulfill that purpose that God has for my life. I know you want to fulfill the purpose that God has for your life. He has a purpose. He has a purpose. And the main thing I can say to you is stay on course. Stay on course. If you stay on course, you will arrive at that purpose on time and in time. You don't want to be delayed like the Israelites. God knew what they were going to do. He gave them chance after chance after chance after chance like he gives us. And we mess up sometimes and then that delays the purpose of while. We have to come back and get back to where we messed up and then go on from there. So that means the purpose has been delayed some. But you have to stay on course, okay? You have to stay on course. How do we stay on course? By depending on God to bless us and keep us on course. Repent. And I tell people, I repent daily. Some people say that you don't need to repent daily. But I repent daily. I repent more than once a day. Because I don't want anything to keep me from making it into the kingdom of God. That's just how serious this is to me. I don't want to spend eternity in hell. I've done enough sin down here. I don't want to be a part of hell. God forgave me of my sins. He forgives me if I mess up, don't know I've messed up just in case I messed up and don't know that I messed up. And even if I messed up and then caught it and said, oh, I messed up, then I repent. I repent. So whether I know or don't know, I just make it safe for my soul and I repent. And I don't feel like there's anything wrong with if you have to repent a hundred times per day. You repent and go from there, okay? Don't practice sin, but we mess up sometimes. We mess up sometimes. And I thank God for his compassion, his tender mercies, his loving kindness. So he takes care of us. Who is he? He is the Lord God Almighty. He said, I am that I am. God is self sufficient, self-sustaining. There is nothing and no one above God. He looked down on me before I was even conceived. He looked down on you before you were even conceived. And he had a purpose then and he yet has that purpose for your life now. So ask him what the purpose is. Follow his instructions and stay on course, okay? The Lord is good. The subject, who am I? He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the I am that I am. This is Greater Gospel Temple, the Church of Praise and Worship, right here in Dallas, Texas, 2511 Kilburn Avenue, Dallas, Texas, 75216. Our telephone number is 214-403-7563. The email address is ggtchurch66 at Yahoo. Dot com Sunday school 10 a.m. and we go right into our worship after the Sunday school okay and even though Sunday school is worship too but you know we have these categories like I said Sunday school worship and then different meetings through the week I love you enjoy the remainder of your day God is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endured to all generations oh yes I would like to remind you to go to any of the digital stores online that's Amazon, uh, uh, iHeartRadio, Pandora, iTunes, Apple, and you can get the Polk Sisters and Company, and you can get Evangelist Shirley Polk, Evangelist Shirley Polk Davis, get some of our music there, the music that I have online. I would love for you to do that. Go and, and help the ministry, okay? 
I love you. Enjoy the remainder of your day. Enjoy your week. This is the week of the 4th of July. And can you believe this is the second day of July? The time is moving on. It's moving on. It's moving on. And by the grace of God, we're still here. I love you. By the grace of God, I've come a long, 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 long way.